you're listening to the Neil Lampton Show. My name's Joey, and I'm joined by Paul. All right, mate. And by Neil. Hi. Uh, moments of the week? Let's just fly straight into moments of the week. Paul, what have you got for us? Um, Shifley's touch. And oh. turn. Oof. Lovely. Yes. Um, that, that really did. I mean, him and Bayliss just continually impress me with how they play and the maturity they show and the ability that they have. But that touch under that pressure was just magnificent. And then to have the calm just to sort of roll it into the corner was just lovely. He's um, really gone under the radar, hasn't he? Although probably not really. I just think, it, I think he's not as good as Bayliss. And he's not as um, dynamic and impressive as Bayliss in the sort of what he does. I just think he's a really terrific player, isn't he? I think, or at least he'll come on to be a very terrific player. His touch is really I good. I trust him. Yeah, I do. I really like him. I think he makes us much better. And I actually thought that in the top of that 4-3-3, thought he looked very comfortable. And time and time again with this season, we've we've asked him to play so many different positions that I actually don't know what position... He's meant to play, but every time he's just like, "Yep, it's fine, I'll do it." And he's equally adept at covering and defending and being defensive. He's now looks much more of an attacking threat when going forward. Really, really, really good player. Really pleased. And like you say, he's not sort of flashy, is he? He's not flashy about it, but there's uh, there's now a real competence about what he does. I, I not to get too much onto the topic of set pieces, but I think <laughs> there's some work to be done in terms of um, how he directs his balls into the box. But beyond that, I think, yeah, it's nice to have a young player come through who you, you can just kind of rely on to put in the team. And there's no, I don't have any concerns about him being in the team like some of the other kids who come in. He's he's there now. Yeah. There's a handful of players that I just really like at the minute. He's one of them. Um, Neil, your moment of the week? Oh, it could be either of the, the goals that we scored. Yesterday, really, um, we talk about celebrating meaningful goals, and so kind of you go through the season, and you have good moments and bad moments, and you celebrate good stuff. But something about these these final few games where everything starts to have a lot more meaning, and we felt that yesterday when we scored those two goals. Now, to me, it didn't make much of a difference, but there was a there's a great sort of sense of occasion in the, in the ground and when they both put the, the ball into the net both really good goals really good finishes by young lads and you can see how much um, th- those goals meant to them as well no I both uh, really sort of significant moments for me they're, they're very good um, yep I uh, my moment of the week I've got a, I've got a big list here although probably I'll only go through two one firstly just to say a huge 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 thank you to everybody who voted for us in the football blogging awards the um, shortlist came out today and we're on it which oh, means yeah. there'll be another round of voting so um, details of that will be on Twitter um, but I mean, we never really expect to win it. The goal for us really is kind of to be on the short list. So that's very, very we, good of everyone that's voting. <laughs> we know we're not going to win it, don't we? I yeah, mean, well, I <laughs> um, yeah, I think there was, the other ones are either Premier League. I think the, the, the next sort of similar one you would say is the Brentford one. Yeah, that's right. But all there's the a story are... here, guys. There's two awards. The other well, one there's... is Judge's Choice. Now, all we have to do is impress <laughs> a judge with our quality content. Wow. Yeah, so... Um, as How I do said, we do this? Do we get them to but... listen to an hour-long podcast on Comedy City? I'm not sure they're going to, are they? <laughs> yeah, I was wondering. I mean, yeah, we worried about this last time. Which is this... If this is the show they listen to, we're slightly screwed. But, um, yeah... Can we, we do a show reel of my best bits? I think that would work. I think so, yeah. I will... Um, will I'll listen to... I listened to all through. previous 180 hours. <laughs> Didn't your mum do that in the first season? She listened through the entire backlog again. <laughs> possibly, <laughs> yeah, to bits. get the... Um, yeah, quite possibly. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, my f- my on-pitch moment of the week was... Um, what might be the most Doyle thing that ever Doyled was Doyle took a um, kick-off yesterday that he kicked straight out of play for a goal kick. <laughs> It was, it was beautiful, wasn't it? it? I mean, it, <laughs> it was... <laughs> you weren't laughing like this yesterday. I know I weren't, <laughs> but I've had a lot of time to think about it, and I just can't conceive. I mean, you, you at the time were just like, well, Doyle's just won a bet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was really the only conceivable thing that would cause a man to 
Bear in mind that all of his team would have been behind him, which would have just <laughs> kicked the ball straight up. You just think, are you, are you awake, Doyle? You, uh, yeah, but it was it was, it was really magnificent. It was my second. Well, it was my my one of my favourite bits of comedy the entire weekend was when um, McNulty beat two players with a little bit of skin and uh, quite a lot of luck and then tried a double step over yeah. and basically just <laughs> ran into their defender. And you were like, just stop doing it. Just, it's like, McNulty's got many strengths. Dribbling with the ball isn't one of them. Are and every sure? time he does it, oh, the man is pretty I, poor. I'm not, I can't have this, Paul. I can't, you can't say he's not good at dribbling with the ball. He, he scored plenty of goals when he's taken the ball and carried it. No, oh. he's got a lot of goals where he takes two or three touches. He His dribbling is awful. I'm sorry. No, I'm not having it. Sorry. We're just going to have to disagree on this very strongly because um, to say he's got an awful, he's an awful dribbler. Oh. I'll, I'll leave it to Joey to adjudicate. Joey? Well, as usual, I think the truth is somewhere in between years. But I did say yesterday, and I stand by it, that really I don't ever want McNulty to take more than two or three touches. And I, th- I think that I don't think he's the worst dribbler in the world, but he does have a tendency, and I think this probably is something of a of an exemplifier. That's not the right word, but you know what I mean. He, there's an awful lot of lateral running across the edge of the 18-yard box because I'm not quite sure he's got the overall skill to beat a man. And so the the thing is to run laterally. And then as happened yesterday, which would have been just a bizarre League 2 goal, was he ran almost the full length of the 18-yard box and then hit a shot that somehow trickled in, that nearly trickled in, just went past the the, the, the far post. Um, but we get ahead of ourselves because there was a game on Friday that we won against um, St. Evanage, as Dom told me that his <laughs> mum pronounced um, Stevenage. St. <laughs> Evanage. Yeah. Or it might be his, his gran, I think he said. But yeah, St. Evanage. I really liked that. Um, we played them on Friday. Neil, you watched it? Yes, I did. It was a great um, few minutes. Really enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, bloody hell. No, it, I think we we did we did well to start quickly, um, get a couple of goals nice and quickly, and for a while at least, we were in that nice sweet spot of feeling really confident and kind of looking quite potent at the same time. Um, and then things kind of, um, I don't know if there was like a, there was just, it became an online event eventually just because we realised we were going to win it. St. Evanage um, weren't very good and didn't really have much in the belt of them to kind of get back into the game. So yeah, it was, it was a, it was an odd game because it, it was built up as, you know, one of the final four games and we, we knew we had to win. And then when you score two goals um, so early on and you kind of get the momentum and you look a threatening team, it all kind of, points towards, okay, this should be a reasonably um, simple victory. Obviously, they then scored. Oh, they pretty much handed them kind of the goal. Um, but oddly, we then came back again. So um, with a great goal by Kelly. And what I found quite funny was, I think the week before, Joey, you were very pointedly said, um, you're just not going to get a goal from Kelly, are you? Yeah. I, I was just oddly, I was listening back to one of the podcasts and that popped up. And I thought, I don't remember you saying it, but um, it was it was you interesting can... just to... You can file that next to me telling Steve, I think it was Steve Phelps, that I wouldn't back Biamu to score first at 100 to 1 in that game that <laughs> yeah. he leathered that <laughs> volley in. I was like, you yeah, commit to your points. More I think classic. We all do, don't we? And it's, um, it's, I mean, it's a way to be. We all know nothing, do we? And the good thing, I guess the only thing that makes it worthwhile to listen to this podcast is we just know the same amount of nothing as everybody else does about yeah. football. So I think it's up to you whether you want to place any stock in it or not. Let's just hope that it's entertaining. So, Neil, no pressure, but carry on with St. Abonage. <laughs> yeah. um, let's start from the top then, shall we? So the first goal, McNulty, two minutes in. Um, when you're there, when you're sat there watching it, you, you see the ball come to him. I mean, first of all, it, it was a great block from um, Johnson, who stopped um, the keeper, who was absolutely shocking all day long. Stopped the keeper, kicking it out. Came to um, McNulty, great drop of the shoulder. And... He basically had a punt, didn't he? He thought, I'm going to give this a bit of a whack. And when you're there, you kind of watch it go in. And I thought, I thought, oh, wow, he's just done a Ronaldo. That's wobbling all over the place. That's amazing. And then you see it again back on the replay. Um, didn't, have, didn't have too much power behind it. And the keeper essentially just let it go through his arms. So it's a bit of a shame because, it, it, I mean, it's still a good goal. You still, you know, to score from that far out, it's um, pretty good. But I kind of... Unfortunately, I put I kind of categorise that one under sort of Paul Williams kind of goal, where it's just a 
smash from there and you probably should be saving them but um not to worry got it got him ahead it was a <laughs> you're being polite not probably if you don't save that you should be shot well, it I... was right down again sticking to the point and um, strongly um, yeah. Well, I... <laughs> it's, yeah. it's just awful I it's just, just... Oh, you it can't be so... stopping that yeah but... i mean the only, we were discussing it side but we were discussing it side the only thing that was going through our heads was maybe the fact that he'd had his clearance charged down he was a bit sort of overly eager yeah. but you watch his whole body like his whole body positioning how he tries to take how he tries to deal with the ball he's sort of caught in two minds of shall I catch it or try and punch it and you just like that's just like awful just truly truly awful and it's yeah it's nice that we've got a player who'll have a punt from 25 yards but he's basically hit it straight I... down the throat of the goalkeeper I think you're being unfair. I don't think it's a player who... I think that... Look, if you look at McNulty's goals this season, I do think he's very aware of his surroundings and he's... And I think that you, to an extent, it's a punt. But I think he sees the keeper is shaken and thinks, actually, I'm going to hit this from here because there's a good chance. And I think whilst the keeper flaps it, I do think that McNulty smelt blood and that was where it came from. He is, that is who he is, isn't it? Is he's opportunistic in that way. I think there's a lot of credit to be given to him, even though the keeper messes it up. I think that, that otherwise there isn't really a shot on there, is there? Yeah. It's, not, it's an odd thing to do unless you think, actually, that keeper is going to flap at this if I have a go at it. I and there was a I bit of wobble in it as well. I mean, I'm not yeah. like major, but when you, you kind of watch it and at the time it felt like it was, it was moving just a bit. The way he hit it, it was a League Two wobble, so just enough to kind of put an already shaken keeper off. So yeah, so I think it was a, a punt, but it was it was a punt based on everything that was going on around him. He'd, he'd seen the keeper messed up. It lets catch him unaware, and it was a, it was opportunistic, and it's what he's what he should be doing. You know, twenty odd goals now this season. It's what he's been doing all year, really, trying to catch the keeper out. So no, it was um it was a great start. Um, glad he got it on target and it went in and. Then, kind of inexplicably, we, we carried on, didn't we? Um, we actually won a header from a corner, which was um, surprising in itself. And um, I don't think anybody could really... I still can't work out if he actually touched it. I'm guessing he did touch it, he knocked it in somehow. But it didn't feel like it was a McNulty's goal. But um, the eye follow replay is absolutely shocking. And um, when you've only got that in real life to go with, there's not really much you can you can base it on. But... You know, he got there, he was happy. That moved him on to 20 league goals for the season, which is always the, the benchmark for a, a good season. Um, yeah, and that, that really kind of set us up. And we, we were playing neat enough football. Uh, and then 37 minutes in, I can't... Ah, I've gone blank. I can't quite remember the goal. Anybody else? Their goal. I just feel like we let him in. Yeah, Rob McDonald tried to clear it. And of they course, down. Yeah. and then yeah. the guy was. I'll, I'll just quickly put, and you can talk about it. Basically, this, these things happen, and it shouldn't happen. If you look at our second goal, exactly the same thing happened. They played a ball across the back for the centre back, dallied on it. McNulty this time closed it down. Then he had the shot that led to the corner. Like they basically did what we did against Yeovil. They gave us two goals head start. We then went, oh. OK, we'll do the same to you. And we just didn't clear our lines. And it's not. this isn't me picking on Willis. It's just a comment I would have. If your one of your centre-backs has got the ball, I don't like the other centre-back being 20, 30 yards away. Willis should have been closer to McDonald, even if he was just an option for a pass or whatever, because you watch that ball charge down, the guy who scores is in absolute acres of space. And you're just like, well... Willis should be gambling or at least sort of noticing that that striker stood there and moving across a bit. And that's not to blame Willis. It's purely McDonald's fault. He should have done far better with the clearance. But I don't feel like your centre-back partner helped him out on that one. And I think you're right. There's There should always be an option. I think one of the key points here is that there is an option and there was an obvious option there, which was pass it back to Lee Burge. Or it really shouldn't have got blocked down anyway. I mean, I think what shows that there's very clearly an agenda from some fans against Lee Burge was the fact that he got grief for the, for giving the ball to Rod McDonald, who was in acres of when he received it. I mean, the idea that you would you'd give the keeper grief for that, and it's it's a pretty much default move when you're trying to move on forward rather than just smashing up yourself, maybe move on to your defender who can then do something with it. 
I, I, the idea that you could blame the keeper for that is um, baffling to me. But I, I think it, it was just pretty sort of ponderous behaviour from Donald. He, he head down for so long when he, he, was, he was kicking the notice that a player made up about 20 yards on him. And it was um, it was annoying because it it allowed a team into the game and it also kind of threw us a little, I think we're all starting to realise that we're we, we can be a confident team, but also quite a brittle team when it comes to um, confidence and um, things that can shake us. And allowing a team to score when there was no room for it and we were tuning it up um, wasn't really the, the... Hang on, I've just... My, my time job, I'm just looking at it. I said 37 minutes, for the foot, but actually we scored in 37 minutes. There was a bit of a difference between them um, scoring and us scoring. And continue. Right. Um, <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> this isn't the best um, I've ever done on this, um, mainly because I can't remember much of the game. Football Blogging Awards shortlisted podcast, the Neil Lamptey Show. I oh, know. <laughs> going on the hard. Wasn't, time. wasn't the sending off next? Ah uh, no, it wasn't. That was after the goal. Um, was it? After, yeah. So we scored, and then they got he got sent off um, a few minutes after that. So first of all, let's talk about Kelly scoring, which was a great strike. It, I, it felt like an easy chance to me when I was watching it. And then you, you again you watch it back and it was uh, actually on the on the corner of the the penalty area and it was a, a great it's a really good great finish, shot. It? Yeah. And you know, um, Robbins himself was saying that he he, he always fancied uh, Kelly to score. So it's kind of at odds with um, what we've said in the past because he kind of feels when he gets in that area, kind of a little bit unsure of himself. But that was um, the signs of someone who was pretty confident in his ability to strike like a ball and. He, he's changed a little bit in the last few weeks. He's His uh, approach to football, I think he's nudged up slightly. He's allowing Doyle kind of that space behind him to deal with it. And he's he's carrying the ball far more than he used to. And weirdly, he seems a lot more nimble. I, I don't know whether he's just kind of, um, he feels a little bit more free with the ball or, or what. But he, he's quite happy to drop his shoulder and nudge it past a, a few players, which we haven't seen very often from him. So I, I like this um, Liam Kelly. I think it's... Um, it's better for us as a team when you, you're not having him performing exactly the same role as um, Doyle. And I think he, he had a fantastic first half, um, actually. Um, he was a really sort of dynamic and he scored a great goal. And just generally, he was he seemed the guy who was going to kind of um, instigate our attacks and, and move the ball forward. So it was well worthy of his goal. And then I guess the, the killer moment was obviously the sending off. Um I'm still unsure about it. I think you can't really tell unless you're really close and you can see kind of the mannerisms of the player making that that tackle as just what his intentions were. I mean, clearly he caught McNulty. It, it probably was dangerous. Whether it was intentional, whether he actually went in to cause him a bit of harm whilst um, kind of going for the ball at the same time, I don't know. But um, the fact that he got sent off for that... Um, pretty much killed it then and we, we didn't really seem to have much beyond this. I mean, what you guys, what do you reckon about sending off? Yay? Nay? I we thought, thought at the top, so yeah, we well, thought at the time that McNulty was basically playing injured because he his tackle was quite, like the guy just kicked the ball. He was stood on his, he was stood up. McNulty sort of flew in at him because there'd been a little bit of argy-bargy just before that and we were like, oh, okay. And then when he sent the guy off, it was like, we, we, none of us could work out why he must have been like did he stamp on him did he because there was nothing he, if, he didn't really tackle McNulty did he, he sort of kicked the ball, the ball was there to be kicked he kicked it McNulty then sort of slid in on him he had to put his foot down he put it down on McNulty and as you say whether or not he intentionally stamped on McNulty whether or not there was nowhere else for him to put his foot you can't, you can't I've looked at the video you just can't tell the, the referee is in the best position to make that decision and he's made it the way he has. Yeah. And I, I think he was possibly a little bit influenced by the reaction, which I'm, I'm absolutely happy with the amount of times that players react against us. Yep. I think it was, it was quite, it was good. You had Kelly, uh, you had Doyle and quite funnily, you had a, um, Ripley, who seems to fancy himself as a hard man up until the point where actually he has to um, sort of activate being a hard man. So he kind of went flying into the guy who did the, the tackle and then he squared up to them and very quickly realised this guy was both taller, probably stronger, probably harder 
and just walked away. But I think he felt like he'd, he'd done his bit for the cause. And, um, yeah, ultimately, the, the guy got sent off. And, like I say, um, I, I really don't have too much to say about the second half because... All you there was nothing much to say about exactly. The All half. you wanted was some more goals. I mean, people talk about just to almost negate the six-two that we had the other week, just to get back to some sort of parity. And they never really struck me as any sort of intention to do that. It was kind of, it was just kind of ambling around. There was plenty of space to do stuff, but no real sort of um, intention to do it. So yeah, okay. I mean, it, you went away feeling fairly happy that we'd won the match, but I. I couldn't help but just be a little bit frustrated with the fact that we hadn't kind of pushed on a little bit and made more of a statement by getting getting those extra goals um, that we really should have done. You, I mean, at this stage in the season and looking at the kind of how close the table is, you have to take opportunities and you don't get much of a better opportunity than um, at home, 3-1 up against 10 men with a whole second half to go. I mean, you've really got to hammer that one home, I think. I don't think Robinson said the same after the match. I mean, he didn't feel like we were the same team second half. Oh, we were, and it was a, it was a bit of a shame, really. It was a missed opportunity. But he also made. Sort of, I, what system do you think? What formation do you think we played? I think it was very, very fluid. I think we started off. Was it? It was. It, we did both. So we did the four-four-two. I think at some point, but then we also did the the four-two-three-one. I think at one point as well. I know. I can never quite work work out whether it's it's kind of changing by design or the players are almost just sort of gravitating to their natural um, sort of position or whether they feel most comfortable. But yeah, that was that's how I got it, and it was kind of a flux in between the two. I mean, what do you reckon? Well, I thought it was more of a conventional four four two, and but it, it's almost very difficult to actually describe because we were two 0 up after six minutes against a team who didn't really seem to be that bothered. So it was just a bit like, I didn't think Ponticelli played that high at the pitch, but I don't think he he played deep either. But I thought Shipley played more wide left than as a sort of midfield three. And again, I thought McNulty played a lot closer to um, Johnson Clark Harris than he did against Lincoln. I thought there was, that looked definitely more of a strike partnership in that game against... Stevenage, but again, it might just be a case of because the only bits I remember of those game, that game, McNulty was in the middle of the park having shots, which I don't think he was. He was very rarely in the centre of the pitch against Lincoln. He was definitely wider. So I, I couldn't quite get my head around what we were doing. I thought we were playing four four two, and a lot of people were going, "No, no, we were definitely playing four three three." And it was like, "Oh, okay." It didn't. It, I thought. Against Lincoln, we, it was clearly a four-three-three. It couldn't have been anything other than the four-three-three. Against Stevenage, it just didn't. I, I couldn't describe it. It didn't look to be any sort of particular method behind it, other than the fact that Stevenage weren't that good. So there was just a lot of space, and especially in the second half when they went four-three-two. But we didn't have the wide players on the pitch to really exploit it. Or the quality to exp- I think that was what's probably most frustrating about Steven in the second half is we didn't really show much quality. We didn't show much sort of want of a better term desire to to put them to the no, sword. It was just that's a bit. A, that's a good term. Yeah, it was desire. I think there was no kind of sort of intention to to make it happen. I feel like they three one was okay for them, which. I mean, it, it can seem a little bit greedy and like picky, like okay, you know, conserving himself for the big game, all that sort of stuff, but. You sort of think this is League Two. This is the opportunity to really make a statement. This is the opportunity for someone like McNulty to bang in a few more goals, other players to get their some confidence. And the second half, it was just kind of going through the motions in a really sort of um, languid fashion, which is just I, we had to make our own um, entertainment in the end with um, the world's longest rendition of um, Twist and Shout, uh, which. I mean, I love Twist and Shout. It's, it's a great song and it gets everybody singing. Um, there's only so much of Twist and Shout that I can take. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it got to the point where I was like, well, it's becoming a bit of a sideshow now, which well, clearly it was. So um, I don't want to be Mr. Boring, but I'm going to be. Um, yeah, I just felt like it went on a little bit too long for my liking. And that's Stevenage. Do we think that, that is... is um... 
Full Stevenage, yeah, in fact it is. S Paul, do you want to take over and, and do Lincoln? Uh, yeah, so having just sort of based following on from the discussion about what formation we were playing, against Lincoln, Bayliss came in for Ponticelli and it was clearly a more 4-3-3. Three, three. Um, against Lincoln's sort of 4-3-3. Three, three. And yeah, Lincoln scored after a minute and you could sort of see that they had targeted certain areas of our team. And they targeted our fullbacks, and they targeted our fullbacks on the floor and in the air. And a um, friend of the show, Rob Jones, had made a statement on Twitter, basically saying that the big lad pulls wide to the fullbacks, and this could be key. And you were watching it going, yeah, the, he is. He's about 18 foot tall, and he's about 18 foot wide, and. He clearly knows what he's trying to achieve, and the rest of the Lincoln team know what they're trying to achieve with him. Why have we left our fullbacks so isolated? And they scored the first goal. It's a good goal. It's a lot of movement, a lot of players bombing into the box, and it's a great finish. And you're like, shit. After a minute, we're, you know, we're we're, we're doing a, you know, it's Yeovil again. <laughs> conceded in the first ten minutes, and you think, God, there's a lot of been a lot of goals conceded in the first. Well, a lot of goals scored in the first 15 minutes of games at the Rico recently. Let's see what we can do from this. And to be fair, after about three or four minutes, we sort of settled into the game. We got sort of probably marginally on top. There was definitely good play from Bayliss, who is just a class act. He stands out. Kelly was a bit quieter, wasn't really involved, but was sort of trying to get going. Johnson Clark Harris, for me, had his best performance definitely since the Mansfield game was just the one of the only players I thought took the the physical battle to Lincoln wasn't shirking anything was what I really was really impressed is he, he didn't throw himself to the floor he just went for the fight he battled and then on the counter he, he broke down the left and we were all um Laurie behind us was like just don't make a bad decision don't make a bad decision <laughs> and he picked up Bayliss who made a Frank Lampard-esque run into the box and neatly finished into the corner. And at that point, you were like, maybe, you know, we've got this out of our system. It's one all. We're slightly on top at this point. Let's go go again. And I can't really remember us having many chance. I, well, maybe we had the McNulty chance when it went to one all. But again, we don't really break teams down. We didn't really, like... You never thought Lincoln were really on the rack, but you did think that we were on top in a way. And then Lincoln did what Lincoln do. They hit another... And it sort of... I, I find this really frustrating. We discussed this before the pod. I find this really frustrating. Lincoln don't play long ball. Lincoln play a very direct style of play. Long ball is when you kick the ball aimlessly upfield and hope that one of your players gets there. And a lot of the time, the ball goes out of play. You want to, want to emphasis of long ball? Jordan Willis plays long ball. Jordan Willis just punts the ball and hopes that one of his play, teammates is going to get there. Lincoln didn't do that. All their long balls, all the, sorry, all their passes forward, but on the ground or in the air, were directed at a player. And that player, nine times out of ten, won the first ball because he'd either dragged himself into a position where he was up against Grimmer or Haynes, or... He had basically moved Rob McDonald and gone early, and Rob McDonald didn't go with him until it was too late. And that's what happened with the second. Another ball at field, Rob McDonald is in a position I hate my centre backs to be, where he was a yard behind Doyle. They lost the ball. The ball then went past Jordan Willis, who wasn't really aware. Grimmer probably could have done better, should have done better, and they've put the ball in the bottom corner. And. Sometimes football can be that simple. That's how Biamu and McNulty have teamed up a couple of times this season where the ball's just been punted forward, biami has got on the end of it and it's dropped to McNulty. It happens. You've got to be better at reading the situation. You're, if you go for the first ball as Ron McDonald does, you need Willis to back you up. And considering how well those two have played over the season as a partnership, they were really poor against Lincoln. They were, the whole defence, defensively, was were chronic. But that centre-back partnership 
was a disaster and it looked a disaster and Lincoln exploited it. And in games of football, there's many different things that are going on. Sometimes you've got to win the physical battle before you can win the footballing battle. We didn't win. I don't think anyone came out on top of the physical battle throughout the team. Bayliss came out as a technical battle against the players he was up against. He just looked good. Very few other players shone in the same way. But straight after they'd scored, Doyle played of the two kickoffs he had, or well, three kickoffs he had, the better one, where he passed it to <laughs> McNulty, who found yeah. himself in loads of space. He drove forward. Um, again, the ball found its way to Bayliss, who was driving into the box. He pulled it back, and it found its foot way to Shippers, who, as I said, amazing little right foot touch to get it out of from his feet and turn around. And again, we were back to two all. And you were like, okay, there's, what, eight minutes to go until halftime? Nine minutes? We know we've been in this situation. Let's just see this out. Let's just get to halftime. We've been behind twice. We're back to two all. The crowd are all behind you. Like, it's, it's just weird at the Rico at times. Sometimes, I think there was a bit of movement down the sh- left between Shipley and, um, and Haynes. And Shipley's pass was too heavy and it went out of play. And he got a round of applause. <laughs> yeah. And you know that against Yeovil, if he'd have made that pass, it'd have been slated to the hills. So at times, the fans are 100% like, you can make the mistakes and the fans will stick with you. And that was what was happening first half. But it was almost a case of you have to see this out until half time. Again, another Lincoln long ball, another flick on, more confusion in the defence, more indecision by Grimmer. Maybe Birds could have done better. I think he's got to go for it. The play just gets there before him. They roll it across, and the guy's four yards out, and he tucks it into the back of the net. And you're like, okay, we've done it again. We've done the Notts County thing. We've done that thing where we're not mature enough. And you, you saw when, um, I don't know if you might not have seen, but when Lincoln scored that goal, they run over to the manager, and the manager's like, just tell them, like, calm down, reset, go, you know, you, you are winning, but Basically, you haven't won the game. You've scored. That's great. But the, the, there's still 45 minutes to go. There's still a game to be won here. And that sort of attitude, I think, is what, where we lack at times. We don't. We live in the moment too much. We don't look at the whole sort of yeah. the concepts of what's going on. Second half, I thought, basically, we didn't start. We started all right. Then Lincoln scored the fourth. And... Maybe Biami, Biami went down in the box. He got booked for diving. Whether or not it was a penalty, the other end of the pitch to us. Did he get they booked can't... for diving or for booked for descent? Uh, he, he might have been booked for descent. Either way, he wasn't awarded a penalty. Yeah. Either either way, he went down quite. If he do... if he if it wasn't a penalty, then he dived. In my humble opinion, because it he went over in the box without the ball, so. Um, they they countered again. I know I know people sort of think I have a downer for Grimmer, but if you're a right back up against a right footed player, you show him the byline, you show him outside because they can't cross, or that you expect you can manage them. The guy cuts inside Grimmer, plays it to the other lad, who then cuts it across. Maybe Burr should have done better. I think that's one of those ones where I think me and Joe have really. debated. Pum. I think he could have. I think um, that, that in that scenario, you kind of, as a keeper, that's yours all day long. You have to make sure that you're you're getting there. And and he was there. And I don't quite understand how he wasn't able to almost scare the player out out of the situation. But it was just it was just another sort of tentative attempt, rather than the sort of full blooded defending that we saw uh, a few months back. And you know those, those clips that you saw on Twitter of all the players chucking themselves in front of the ball. He didn't feel like that yesterday, and that that was an example really of Burge, where he was just the ball was his to take. That was all, all day long, and just to allow it to the player to stab it underneath him in a really tame fashion. I mean, that that frustrated me something something chronic. That's fine. As I, said, I yeah, I I think I give Grim a bit more. I think I'm um, sorry. I think I give Burge a bit more. I I, I thought it was a little bit. I, I, me and Joey discussed. I think he wasn't expecting the ball, and I think the guy is, is charging in on him. But I, I almost hold my hands up. It's sort of a case of 
maybe Birch should have done better and everyone and you're you're hundred percent correct. Neil And might... you look Go on. And I think you you go back to all the goal you go back through all the goals bar the first one and on every single one of them there is a Coventry player up against a Lincoln player yep. and the Lincoln player wants it more. Yeah. Yeah. And that is the, the frustrating key. thing. Yeah. Yep. And that that worries me going into the playoffs. Not because yesterday was a, a do or die, we can't lose this. We can still get in the playoffs. But that mentality is a worry. That that sort of lack of that, that I hate using the word desire and heart, but it is that lack of sort of personal pride as well. That like, I can deal with it. All I've got to do is kick this. <laughs> All I've got to do is like take one for the team here. And no one did. Not and, I, and then you go for the individual performances. That was the worst performance I've seen from McNulty for ages. <laughs> Doyle was awful. Um, and as the guy next to me said, like, he didn't even shout at people. He was just out of the game quite a lot. Um, I, I thought Shipley had a good game for Bailey. had a good game. Kelly was very quiet. Grimmer does what he does. He gets up the pitch, but his final ball just isn't that good. Like, he put on one really good cross. Credit to him. The rest of them just aren't very good. Haynes was poor going forward. You just go for the team that's like no, too many underperformed, too many had bad games. And then you just go, well, okay, it's now down to the manager. The manager has to make the right substitutions. Lincoln have got massive defenders. Oh, we bought on Ponticelli. Oh, we've, we bought on Biami, that's great, but we've taken off Johnson Clark Harris, who's having a really good game. And you just thought, well, we're left on the pitch now with two midgets up against the Lincoln defence who've, who've won everything in the air all game. We're not getting back into this. Why? Again, it's like <clears throat> you, you needed someone like Carl Reed who could carry the ball at them, make them... We didn't, we didn't get at their right back enough. We didn't... When we did, like Johnson Clark Harris did it for the first goal, Bayliss did it for the second goal, you like that they had... They were playing 4-3-3 with three attackers. There was space on the wings for us to exploit. The reason we didn't exploit it, we didn't have a winger on the pitch. We ended up the game with two poachers on the pitch, but no creativity other than Bayless. And you just... These are the mistakes that we're making. Everyone. I think no one comes out of that game with any... Apart from Bayless and Shipley to a lesser extent. The management don't come out of this with any credit and the team don't. The only person who comes out with any credit, from my personal point of view, is I was really impressed with Lincoln. I thought they looked like a team who knew what they were trying to achieve. They had a game plan that they stuck to. They identified our weaknesses and they hammered them. And they took their opportunities really well. And they, they, they were clinical. They had the opportunities and they wanted to win it. And they won it. And fair play to them. I've, I've never seen a team so sort of cynical in their, in their fouling. Because it was like they were on rotation in that second half. Where <laughs> they got to the point where they were like, right, you're next to foul. You're next to... Cause they, they just saw the game out, and it will be classed as streetwise. I mean, there's a part of me that really resents the fact that you're able to do that in a football match, and they were able to get away with what was for maybe 20, 30 minutes some of the most cynical football you will ever see in your in your life. It was, it, it was rotten, really, that that they were able to do that. But the fact is, they were getting booked for it. It was just a different person each time was getting booked, and they were in a strange way. That's almost within the rules. It's your prerogative to get booked if you want to do that. Fine. Um, that that was a little bit un, unsavoury, but that's that's just a, a, an aside point, really. It doesn't mean anything because ultimately they'd already beaten us. I think they'd done they'd done most of the hard work, and they 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 probably just showcased why they're they're a better team than us. And, that, and that, I guess that was go on. Well, I guess their counter argument, and I know you're not not saying this, or I know you're not saying this. Their counter argument would be you came down last season and we came up last season and there's a massive imbalance in, you know, finance, quality and everything else. And we'll play the game that we think gives us the best opportunity given the resources at our disposal. And I, th- and I kind of think it they it is an imbalance and they found a way to correct it somewhat, haven't they? I, I, I sort of think if you've it shouldn't be an excuse to lose a game. And I don't think you're saying it is an excuse. I think you're talking about it being unsavoury. But I yeah, kind of think yeah. we should we should have more than enough about us to, to be able to deal with that and to incorporate it ourselves. But, the, we, you know, they just it worked perfectly for them, didn't it? And I think more from my point of view, I think that was really disappointing, is that they, 
they just looked like they had got all of the basics right, and that was enough to put four goals past us. And that's I'm glad you said that there's an imbalance as well, because I think sometimes we get drawn into the mindset because we're in this league. There's um, we kind of become part of this league in the sense where everybody's like a level level playing field. And in reality, this shouldn't be a level playing field. We have a lot more going for us. We have we have choice of the players in this league. You give someone a choice to come to us or you come to any of the other teams, they they want they should want to come to us. And more often than not, they they do want to come to us. So we we have that going for us. And we have you know all these sort of um, non tangible things around sort of fans and stuff supporting the team. All these things that are supposed to make it better for the for for the players. So there there should be an imbalance there. So what we end up with is this strange situation where we now we we can't make the automatics which points wise we still could yesterday and if it somehow inexplicably means that if 80 points gets um, you the automatics and we've messed this up i've i've been going to be livid about that but um, yeah uh, hey ho that, that's happened already but what gets me more is the fact that we're now scrambling for that final place in the playoffs i mean it's, it will be a scramble because and it's been a theme of mine throughout the season because we can't trust the team and I don't think the team can trust themselves to perform to kind of their capabilities on a regular level. And that's that showcased so well by the fact that they've won three games in a row once all season. I mean, that's in- well, incredible, it, isn't it? Well, we've, we've lost a third of our league games. We've lost 15. <laughs> and you look at, I think Luton has scored 33 more goals than us and conceded one less. Uh, and... It's you go for, you just look you look at these things and it's like the great defensive record we had, we've now conceded what eleven goals in our last three home games, and we haven't we played and this is it's only on names it's purely only on names but we've conceded eleven goals against Yeovil, Lincoln and Stevenage, and it's just like that's just I mean I think Yeovil have only scored ten in the last ten games six of them were at the Rico. Lee Burge is holding on to his um, Keeper of the Year award very um, tightly tonight because um, he wouldn't have got that at, at this point in the season. Um, it, it, it was only because he <laughs> those votes went in um, way before um, these, this period of games. But the only reason he got that, got that award was because of our record, wasn't it? Well, you could, I mean, you could say the same about sort of Jack Grimm must be holding on to his PFA right back of the year award and Jordan Willis is holding on to his centre back exactly. award. It's, it's just like this... Uh, the, the, <laughs> There are, there are more, we might still go up. There's still the opportunity. We're still in the best position we could be. Not the best position we could be in, but we're still in a strong position to go up. The worry is that we're in this position mainly because Mansfield have picked up like seven points in the last 10 games. Mansfield have imploded in a remarkable way. And we're not going to get... God bless them for get, that. Yeah, God, <laughs> God bless Steve Evans. Who, who thought that we'd ever say that? But basically, we're going to go... Sometimes the team that gets into seventh in the playoffs is the team that goes up because they're the team that were, like, tenth at Christmas and they've gone on one hell of a run. Like, Weren't we second in the form table before yesterday? So we the, were. It's, no, yeah, we but were. It's, I'm, is that made up? So I can't remember. I was just saying it. Because lies, it, damn lies in statistics. We, we were second in the form again, we, take, sorry. Go on, Paul. We weren't playing well. <laughs> and we, we've, we, I still don't think Mark Robbins knows what his best team is or formation is. Correct. And and you could see that against uh, against Link, and you could see that there was sort of there, there was no uh, the biggest worry was all season our defence has been our, our biggest strength, and the lack of cohesion between our back four yesterday was worrying. What also really worried me is I haven't seen Lincoln play this season. But I know that Lincoln are very much a team who play a particular style of football. And I can't believe that we left our fullbacks, who I don't think are defensively that great, that exposed. That just baffles me how we left Grimmer and Haynes open to that sort of attack. And the fact that they were found wanting again worries me because it's just, it, it, proves, it just shows that no one's learned anything. From the manager through the players, it's it just how. And I said, like Rob Jones, on Twitter, two days or three days ago, went, "This is what they will do." 
and it happened. It clearly happened. You're watching it happen. You're going, and this is no offence to Rob, but if a fan sat there going, this is what they're going to do, and our manager hasn't prepared our team for it, and if he has prepared for for it and the players have let him down, that's fair enough. But the, the amount of times that our fullbacks were isolated for that style of play was criminal. It was absolutely criminal. And, they, and that was their game plan. Absolutely their game plan. And we didn't counteract it at any point. Um, what are we going to do, guys? <laughs> well, <laughs> are we, we going to fix this? Going back to the, the form table, so the thing of us being second in the form table was based on it being across the last 10 games, which I guess is the sort of... Handy. The, well, it's the unusual form table. I guess six is the standard for it. And uh, yeah, across the last 10 games, it was only Accrington that had got um, more points over that time. The six-game form table as it stands um, after yesterday would place us in 17th, one place above Cheltenham, who we play on <laughs> Saturday. It lies, damn lies in statistics, obviously, all the time. Weird, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and that game, we I caught up with Dom just before to, um, to, to get a preview on that, and we'll drop that in now, and then do a little bit of listeners' questions, and then wrap things up. Here's Dom. Hello, Dominic. How's it going? Not too bad. Um, you were there last night, weren't you? I want to ask you, because obviously, you know, you're the guy. How surprised right. were you? Um, I was surprised in the sense of just how much both teams kind of went for that game. I suppose, um, looking at our standings right now, like having lost that game, you are looking at it over your shoulders a bit, maybe, if Mansfield pick up some form, which shows just how important winning that game was for either side. But I thought a draw might well have suited both sides. And I thought that was going to be the kind of approach. And then both teams kind of approached it like it was the biggest game of the season. And there was there was a real big game mentality. And I, I just didn't see that kind of intensity in the game coming. And I think just the difference between the two sides was one team clearly just seemed more used to competing in bigger games and forcing results. And you just saw the inexperience of quite a few players in our side, especially at the back, where we were just losing first and second balls time and time again, getting muscled off stuff, just making unnecessary errors. And that that was the difference, I thought. I just... I didn't see or I'm starting I'm trying to remember what's happened during the rest of the season but I just don't remember McDonald and Willis being so like rusty and shaky and like obviously I think when you look at our center backs and I apologize because we've probably doubled up on this if we're talking about it on the yeah. pod but the, the you Tom Davis, fair play, you imagine is sort of the chief header of the ball but McDonald and Willis aren't far back from that but yesterday they looked so far off it didn't they yeah, it's weird because, I mean, I remember watching Willis against Akin Fenway back in December and he kind of dominated him during that. So you wouldn't have thought he would have been overly bothered. But I've seen just on a few occasions this season, it's just a really weird thing where I don't know whether they're standing too far up the pitch or they're just really bad at reading goal kicks. There's just like a few times where it just looks like they've been completely caught out of position from a really simple goal kick and I, I don't know where that comes from yeah very strange anyway we've got two games left the first of which on Saturday is Cheltenham who are in 16th at the minute we all know from yeah. the Yeovil game that teams in that sort of position with nothing to play for pose no threat whatsoever so with that as a given um, how what sort of game can we expect yeah so you would imagine Cheltenham have nothing to play for but they have scored more goals than anyone outside the playoffs. And I think the only teams that have scored more goals than them are all in the top five. So they're a team that score a lot of goals. They're a team that concede a lot of goals, which I showed last week when they lost 4-3 against Cambridge. But as we saw when they played us at the Rico, they can play some nice football a bit create some decent chances and it's whether they finish them off and whether they can keep it tight enough at the back 
And as you can tell from their league position, more often it's the wrong way round. And at the moment, they've only actually won one of their past six games. But I still see them as quite a dangerous team for us to play because we're playing under pressure and they're not. And they're just naturally a team that seems to score a lot of goals. Where do those goal- goals come from? They've got, and I, I don't know whether it's Issa or Isa, but their main man is uh, is that chap who some people have suggested is that Robbins is interested in. What sort of player is he and who else have they got to look out for? Well, I would imagine Robbins would be interested in someone who scored 24 goals this season <laughs> in this division. Yeah. If he wasn't, you'd, you'd have to question it. I mean, I imagine he's someone who's going to be off to a, certainly, I'd say a top half League One side. I would imagine... Even you're looking at sort of the lower championship club might want to take a take a punt on him. I mean, he scored, as I said, 24 goals, and that's after coming straight from I think the ninth tier, uh, Greenwich Borough. And he's he's a quick player. He's got a decent amount of skill, and his finishing has improved over the course of the season. And by the way, his brother called Abo Issa um, played for Shrewsbury and is a winger and scored an absolutely brilliant goal at the weekend for Shrewsbury so the ESA family is definitely a, a very talented footballing family and it was an interesting article today in the Guardian about how they came out of uh, Sudan out of by the uh, refugee crisis there so interesting little sub story to Mohamed Issa uh, just, other... just quickly on Mohamed Issa is he a winger or is he an out and out striker Striker. He's a striker, okay. Yeah. Yeah, and just elsewhere through Chapman's side, um, I say in midfield, have some decent quality for this level uh, in Joe Morrell, who was on loan from Bristol City, who, of course, managed by Gary Johnson's son. Uh, a bit of a favour loan going on there. And he's just a really excellent set piece taker, sort of a box box midfielder. He's chipped in with the, the odd goal and assist. They've also got Carl Winchester, who I saw some Cheltenham fans trying to argue that actually Carl Winchester was their player of the season, but they're wrong. I mean, I mean they've got they've, <laughs> how many how many seasons are Cheltenham going to have a 24 goal striker? <laughs> Something wrong wrong with some people. Yeah, uh, but he's sort of just an energetic box box midfielder, a bit creative, can also play it right back. Uh, at one point, looks really promising youth prospect with Oldham. He seems to lose his way a bit, but. He's back in the business now, and they've also got Harry Pell, who is a good sort of technical midfielder in D2, and again, someone who can chip in with your goal, and trying to our side who can play a bit in midfield uh, and work the ball around. It's just sort of the rest of the team, fairly functional, fairly slow. Uh, I suppose the only other noticeable player, if only for his name, is Elias Chatsy Theo Doridis who's nice. on loan from Arsenal. He plays at left-back. And apparently he's been quite a good loan signing for them too. But I just wanted to try and say his name right, really. Hey, you did a fantastic job. Much better than I would have managed. Um, how do you see it playing out on Saturday then? What was the, what, what's your score prediction? It's going to be interesting how Mark Robbins just reacts to the Lincoln result. Because obviously from his post-match interview, he didn't seem too pleased. But you, what you want to avoid now, in basically... We have to get at least a draw from this game, you would imagine, just to avoid a really tense final game. I suppose it would still be tense if if we got a point, but I suppose you could put that down as sort of starting to turn the shift around after a notable defeat. Mm. And if he if he goes out and makes four or five changes, that's that's not going to help at this stage. I think. Try and try and keep the team settled. Try and focus on the positives from Tuesday night, which was some really good attacking play at times. And I thought yeah. uh, Baelish and Shipley linked up really well. They looked like two players who played a lot of football together in yeah. the youth team. I thought and that was quite impressive in patches. Uh, but obviously, we've got to focus on the defence. We've got to have at least someone playing on the right wing, which would be helpful. Um, I'm really struggling to put my uh, head around this. Uh, I'm going to go for it being a 2-2 draw. Oh, OK. Um, well, and the question will be, will that be enough? But hopefully Mansfield will continue to shoot themselves in the foot as uh, as 
amazingly well as they have done so far recently. Right, OK, we will catch up next week. Thank you very much. OK, speak to you then. Uh, OK, thanks, Dom. Yeah, um, yeah. I, oh, an interesting game on Saturday. One that really we could have done with going into with the little bit less pressure, but the, um, I'm sure we will do our best as usual. Is there any final thoughts on Lincoln before we move on? No, we can analyse it to death. Um, yeah. yeah, if it has happened now, the, the only positive you can take from it is a couple of young lads scoring good goals and we still retain control over our destiny. So it, it's not it's not terminal, it's just frustrating because of who it was against. Um, I'm going to hit you with a couple of um, interesting, well, I'm interested in inverted commas, questions that I came across over the last couple of days. Uh, quick fire, I want an answer very quickly. How many Jordans have played for us this season? Paul? Five. Neil? Five. It is five. Can you name them all? Willis, Shipley, Ponticelli. McGuire uh, Drew. And then Thompson. Correct, Amundo. Five Jordans. Um, Good, isn't it? I mean, We've yeah. had about ten over the last couple of years, though, haven't we? Jordan Clark, Jordan um, Turnbull. I don't think there's been a squad in the last decade where there hasn't been a Jordan in it, which is remarkable. Um, yeah. I mean, people will look back at this team and call it the five Jordan season, won't they? I think that's <laughs> yeah. the, um, they that's better. The Can we make a T-shirt of that one? Yeah. And second question, who is our top? Who is our second top scorer this season? Nason, isn't it? It's Jukens Nason, yeah. Three goals out ahead of the, um, of the next nearest person. I was quite surprised when I saw that earlier. Although Who's the know. next nearest? Was that uh, Jody Jones or Biamu? Yeah. Jody Jones, Jones, Jody, Jody Jones um, has got five, yeah, five. and Biamu has Biamu's got five. Got three. Ponticelli's got five. If you, they're all cup and all competitions goals. Yeah, yeah. Ponticelli's got three in the league, and Biamu's got three in the league. Yeah, and, and you, Jonathan Clark Harris has got two in the league. Yeah, the penalty four, and the goal against Crew. Four in total. Yeah. Um, okay, let's do a couple of listener questions before we wrap up then. Um, from Ed Wilson. Uh, Mark Robbins was incredibly angry after last night's performance. With that in mind, what's the funniest thing you've heard so far this year? I think we'll probably move on from that. that <laughs> um, ben... But did you see the interview where basically um, our friend um, Jeff didn't even ask him a question? <laughs> He's yeah. sort of gone sort of to the other side now. Yeah. He's not even bothered irritating. He's just sort of... That was amazing. Brilliant, wasn't it? Was yeah, like, he actually, basically starts looking at the wall at one yeah. point. Mark Robbins is sort of, what's going like, on here? This is the wrong time to look at the wall, Jeff. He's angry. <laughs> I um, I thought Robbins' is post-Mans... Not post-Mansfield. post Notts County um, press conference was quite infuriating. But yesterday's, I kind of thought, I'm actually, I'm with you on this. Because he, he basically, he just, he, he just for like two or three minutes, was just like, you've got to learn how to head a ball. And I was like, well, yeah, yeah you're right. <laughs> right. I think we needed it as fans. <laughs> yeah. We needed it because we felt so much. And yeah, I think the last thing we would have wanted was him coming out and kind of being really passive about it because yeah. it's it's so important now. So well, what that does and what that means, who knows? I mean, we don't know how the player's going to react to it. But from a kind of a, a fan engagement point of view, it kind of, it helped to sort of lift me a little bit because I kind of felt that sort of empathy with him. Like, oh, hang on, this guy's angry as well. Mm. Good. Yeah, and it was the right place for his anger to be, wasn't it? Um, Neil, question for you. Again, possibly rhetorical from uh, Ben Pilks Lions on Twitter. Why the fuck do we still bother? I want, I'm asking you that specifically because you're more likely to give me a sunnier answer. Got a season ticket for next year. <laughs> You're a crazy I mean, man. I know. I was walking out of the game and my mate goes to me, I heard you got a season ticket. What the fuck's wrong with you? I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, it wasn't the right time to ask me that because I just walked away. But the, the only reason I'm doing it is financial. It just, I can't do what I've done this year, which is get sort of lured into matches on a game by game basis and end up spending 25 quid each game because it's mm. just mental I know I'm going to want to go I'll, I'll end up going and I'll get my money's worth so I just did it well you won't get your money's worth but you'll go no, no as I said that I thought nah that's not the right phrasing is it um, <laughs> no <laughs> no but, not yeah, at all so I'm in I'm in there so I've missed one season this season season ticket wise out of since 1996 
good one. Well, that was a, but then I've pretty much been to every home game anyway, so mm. that's a rumour record, needlessly. Um, final question from Ian Heron, friend of the show, Ian Heron. Question for Paul. Can you confirm or debunk the belief that we perform worse in front of big crowds at the Rico? I know that you've not been given much of an opportunity to stat this out, but I think it's, um, I think, largely speaking, it's true, isn't it? It feels like it's true, doesn't it? I think that's the thing. It <laughs> does feel like we tend to um, come a cropper. So the, I mean, the opposing argument that is we tend we do to do it against low Yeah, Sorry. we get big gates against decent teams. Therefore, the chances of us losing are higher. However, um, maybe if the uh, Morecambe game's important, we should all just not bother going. And, uh, yeah. Um, but I think I it was not... Point. But, it's sorry. just that we, we lose in front of small We lose anyway, well. yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's not like... Uh, yeah, we just happen to lose a lot of games. Uh, uh, I think that's the most frustrating thing. I think this season isn't the fact I mean there's many reasons for this season been frustrating I think it is also the fact we still lost so many games of football the only mitigating thing I had about last night's game or the Lincoln game whenever you listen to this is it was one of the first times I felt this season where we just got beaten by a team who were just better than us I know, I know that's almost a sort of perverse thing to say but I've seen us lose against utter garbage this season at least against Lincoln I thought a bit like the um Oh, when, yeah, Atkinson Stanley beat us. At least I just came away going, well, actually, they're a good side and they're probably better than us. Man, If not man for man, then their whole system, like, both of Lincoln and Atkinson, I felt we were playing against a, a actual football team that knew what they were trying to achieve. And I don't really feel like for long periods this season we've been that team which is why we're still struggling to get in I think as you said earlier we do have some advantages I think player for player we have quite a good side and there are reasons why we're in the top seven some of it I think is just the fact there's a lot of dross in this league and that's one of the reasons we're there but I think we're not as cohesive as some of the a lot of the other teams who I think just look better than us and that's because you could argue they've had longer to build Atkinson and Lincoln I mean the guy at Lincoln's been there since I think May 2016 his win rate is nearly 60% you know they got promoted last season they're a, they're a, a team going places they look like a team going places they look like managers who are going places whether or not they could go to a higher league and Maybe when people would start asking them to, you know, play more football, they would get found out a little bit. Maybe it's a bit easier in the lower leagues where you can get players to be drilled and aesthetically you don't have to be as pleasing. But I think the fact they were so well drilled, the fact they were so well organised and the fact they did have a definitive game plan, maybe that shows that they can manage at a higher level as well. Plus we continue to fanny about with our team yeah. Every single match, regardless. I mean, it may be small changes, maybe big changes, but I mean, you, you made the point earlier, we do not know what our best team is. And at this stage, I, I really don't know what our best formation is. It it still feels shoehorned, whatever, whatever we do. So that, well, that's, if that's, well, there's your concern, isn't it? That's just, you know, that, that, that we, we cannot pick it. And when, even when we are, it's really just about getting our best players onto the pitch, it seems, rather than... <laughs> that that lineup, like like you say, that the Lincolns have got in the Accrington way, they've just got this go-to kind of formation, a go-to strategy, which is, is worth for them for a long period of time. We're kind of stumbling our way to this point and potentially over the line as well. Oh, can I hear, can I hear, sorry, just sorry. very quickly, can I hear Jane talk, coughing in the background? Do you? Is she in the room? Do you subject her to this entire thing? <laughs> no, she's been doing other stuff. I don't know what she's doing now. Poor Jane. Jane, make him go in a different room. Oh, what's in a different room? Sheesh. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll make a final before, point before, and then we'll, uh, we'll yeah, wrap things before up. Before we go. Um, someone on Twitter was like, well, we only actually made one change between the two games. We brought in Bayless of Ponticelli, which is, is strictly true. We did make one physical, like human for human change. The difference is, McNulty played on... If we play 4 3 3, he played on the left against Stevenage. He got moved to the right. So that's one move. Shipley got moved from midfield to playing 
up front. That's another move. Kelly, who was playing more offensively against Stevenage, moved more defensively. That's another move. And Bayliss came in and then played a different... So even though you're only playing one player, changing one player, you're actually moving like four or five. And the relationships between all the players as well. But if we yeah. if we buy into that as a as a thing, the dynamics between players, you change one player changes the way that other players around them react. It's 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 always more than just um, like for like usually. And I think sort of if uh, um, Bayless is more on the left, so suddenly instead of having Shipley in front of them, um, Haynes' closest player was Bayless, who's so never. They've never been on the same pitch, as far as I've seen before. Bayliss normally plays on the right if he's playing in the midfield centre-back partnership. You know, that, that probably didn't help Grimmer, the fact that his nearest player was McNulty, who sort of tries to get back defensively, but you can sort of see that, he's, he, you know, he scored 20 league goals this season. I don't want my 20-goal season striker tracking back to help my right-back out, unless he's sort of that sort of player who can do everything. He's not that player. McNulty definitely is not that player because the players aren't like that aren't in League Two. So leave your 20, 20 goals season striker in range of the goal and get someone else to track back and help the right back out. Uh, any final thoughts? Final final thoughts. No, I just hope they'll get it done. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, if you want to get in touch with us, it's neilamptyshow at gmail.com, at neilamptyshow for the Twitter. If you could do us an enormous favour and head to twitter.com slash neilamptyshow, you'll find the details of how to vote for us in the finals of the Football Blogging Awards. Um, it's just a, it's just a small link that you click that generates a tweet, and then you click send, and then that does everything for you. Um, thank you to all those of you who have voted already, but there's a second round of voting, so a second vote would be uh, muchly appreciated. Uh, I think the Ed Wilson t-shirts are still on sale. Nobody's bought <laughs> one yet, obviously, but the, if you're so inclined to do so, it's a fabulous t-shirt. Um, and I think that's everything. That's all the plugs for this week. Um, thank you, Paul. Cheers, mate. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, boys. And thank you, listeners. Bye. Bye.